Is there a gift in your life that you continue to appreciate or understand or explore? We have a, uh, we have a new car, a newer car in our lives. And uh, with each day as I drive it, I learn new things about it, or it talks to me about what it can do. And uh, it's, it's quite interesting. But our summer series here at Northminster, each week we're exploring passages of Scripture that teach us about God's gifts, gifts that we continue to understand and enjoy in our life. Today's gift is the gift of release how we are released from critical and hurtful judgments and find our life and work in Jesus, our judge of grace. If you brought your Bibles, our scripture reading today is found in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Listen to this reading of God's word. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign, and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena, We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. God, we thank you for this reading of your word. Help us, Holy Spirit. Help us to hear your voice to follow you in faith, and to find our life in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You had one job. It's kind of a funny series of pictures or memes flying around these days with that caption. You had one job. And usually there's a picture of an obvious fail. Right? For example, you had one uh, cashier wanted, must be 18 years old, with 20 years experience. Or uh, this next one, you pull up and you're supposed to so top with your car. You had one job, right? Or this one, 
uh, illegally parked cars will be fine. They'll be just fine. Not a, not a problem. Or this one, a sale in a grocery store for curved yellow fruit. You couldn't come up with banana? You had one job. Or this one, you know, uh, I'd love to see how your Love to see how your automatic driving car would follow uh, this road. Just, you had one job. Right. Thanks, Chris. What do you do in life? What's your one job? And in real life, as you know, we don't just have one job. We have many. But what does God's presence in your life do with you and in you for your purpose and work? As you have seen in that video, we have had an amazing and blessed week here at Northminster on our campus. And I think this last week preaches this sermon way better than me. We all worked and we worked hard, but it was a work of joy where Jesus was lifted up and it was a thing to behold. Uh, uh, we had over a hundred kids volunteers working. We talked to the kids about the Bible stories of Moses, the baby in the basket on the ri all river water stories. We talked about Nam and dipping in the Jordan seven times, trusting God. We talked about God parting the Jordan River so the people could go across. We talked about Jesus being baptized and how important it is to say yes to Jesus. We raised money for clean water. We sang praises to God. And, and as you can tell, uh, I personally had so much fun leading songs and leading, helping the, with the assemblies. I had somebody come up to me last week and say to me, you know, it's a real joy to see someone who enjoys what they do. And I said, well, thank you. I said, but you know, and I say this a lot, I work for a great boss. And I do. And it's such a joy, such an honor. So friends, what do you do in life? It's a common question in our country. The word occupation relates to what occupies your time and attention. And are you occupied in life with anyone besides yourself? How does Jesus play into that? In our scripture reading today, it's quite curious. Once again, Paul is upset. <laughs> he's upset because he's being judged and critiqued by some Christians in Corinth, in the Corinthian church. And so Paul lashes out a bit he, he, and we can learn from the armchair attitude Corinthians. That's what I'm calling them today. Anybody ever be an armchair quarterback watching sports? All right. Yesterday, my Birmingham Stallions won the championship of the USFL. Wow, George, thank you. But I was making critiques and calls about, oh, that was a dumb play. Oh, that was an amazing play. It, the, when a remote is in your hand, you become a referee. And in the Corinthian church, their first problem was that they were sitting in judgment. They were evaluating which Christian leader was their favorite and really a better Christian. Paul I only God knows our hearts, and He will bring to light what is hidden. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, friends, yes, there are moments in our life when we, when we know folks we love and trust, and if we see them living in destructive ways, we need to approach them, talk to them, help them. But when you start ranking yourself in comparison to others, who is the better Christian really, you invariably end up ranking yourself higher, which can lead to arrogance. And that's what was happening in Corinth. Paul says, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. The second problem with the Corinthians is that they were sitting on a sofa of satisfaction. 
the, the Christians in this region were in various groups, maybe cliques, and they were fond of seeing their group as the right group, the best group. And so Paul is responding here telling them they need to find their soul satisfaction in their Savior. Uh, and, and, and he points out, do not go beyond what is written, or else then you'll become puffed up as a follower of one of us over against the other. The third issue with the Corinthians was that they were puffed up with smugness. I like how the Bible scholar David Pryor has pointed out that the Corinthian Christians had settled into the illusion that they had become the best they could be. <laughs> how many of us here would say, we are probably the best Christians in Tucson? Oh. Or that Northminster is such a great church, it is the best church. Careful. I get wonderful comments from folks. We have a Next Steps class next Sunday uh, to learn about joining our church. And, and often someone will say to me, North, man, it's such a wonderful church. This is a great church. And I usually reply, thank you. Come a long ways, but we've got a ways to go. And the important thing is we're trying to follow the way, truth and life, who is Jesus. And so Paul says, who, who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? Get it as a gift. All right. They had become satisfied with themselves rather than seeking ways to continue to grow and serve in their Savior. And so, friends, Paul points out for us today what I call our high and low calling, our job in life. And it's both high and low. And we can see it clearly in this one statement he makes at the beginning. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Do you see those words servants and entrusted? There is our high and low calling. Let's start with low. Number one, Paul is saying here, look at me and really, I believe, look at any Christian as an under rower of the word servant in verse 1 means. In the original language, it, it literally means under rower. The person in the big ship who's not rowing in first class, <laughs> but rowing on a lower deck, but rowing. That's Paul's word for himself and for us as Christians, to row. You know, this week we made good use of this, and I talked with the kids about how this is a symbol of faith in action. When you are scared, when you are uh, not sure what's going to happen in life, keep rowing and trusting that God is with you in what you are doing. You're an under, it's a lowly calling, but it's one of real life. The second, though, is our high status. You are an overseer of the revealed mysteries of God. And Paul is saying, this is the word entrusted. Again, in the original language, uh, the word is oikonomos. It means you are a manager, an overseer of an inheritance. That's a high responsibility. And the inheritance is the revealing from God that Jesus, who was tortured, beaten, and crucified, came back to life, rose from the dead to show the world he is the Messiah of God. That's our good news, which is our responsibility to show, demonstrate, and speak. Paul says, I am a steward. Years ago at a church I was serving, I, I'll never forget it, we had a new members class at that church, and we asked the people to introduce themselves to the elders, and this one woman said with a big smile, she goes, well, I am a steward of the mysteries of God, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, and I am, 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 am an ambassador of God's kingdom, cleverly disguised as a secretary. 
And I loved it. I loved it. What would you say your identity and role in life is? Some of you would say, well, I'm a teacher. Some would say, I work for the county. Some of you would say, well, I'm retired. Some of you would say, I'm a student. But friends, are you willing to be an under rower for Jesus and an overseer of his good news? Dorothy Sayers once said, work is not primarily a thing one does to live, but the thing one lives to do. Sharing, speaking, offering the love of God in your life. You know, friends, Jesus had one job. Jesus had one job to do, and he got himself killed doing it. Jesus' one job was to obey and serve his heavenly Father who gave him the one job of supreme love. And Jesus does not ask us to be successful. He asks us to be faithful. And even when we are not faithful, He continues to love us and give us a new start. Our one job is in the work of Christ, the work of love, which will inspire us and guide us into eternity. Can we pray about that? Lord, give us your work to do today. Give us that role of being forgiven, redeemed, and sent today. Lord, show us with great joy who we can be in you and how your life in us can bring life, healing, and hope to others. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen.